carefully, after a fashion. And the bridesmaids are those seagulls. A lovely lady is making her first exciting journey across the blue sea. Her heart beating faster and faster. Or put less romantically, a new ocean liner is going through her trials. But why be unromantic when the liner, every inch of her, is such a lady as Oriana? A lovely ship with the name that Elizabethan poets gave to their queen. She's unique, from those fiberglass lifeboats, the biggest ever molded in one piece, to her sheer line and the slope of her bows. At the table, ship owners and their team of experts faced a problem. How to make a ship of the size they'd acquired travel smoothly at over 27 knots, a speed that can normally be economically achieved only by a bigger and longer ship. Only the naval architects could solve the problem with a revolutionary hull design. The contract drawing. The first sketches of the brush by tension testing devices to a traveling gantry showed the experts how the hull should be shaved and refined for top performance. A sort of waxwork rehearsal of what welded steel would one day do. But what when the weather is foul? A wave-making device shows how the ship will ride 40-foot waves. Dirty weather indeed that had called for spectacular sea-keeping qualities. You can glimpse the future here in this tank with a ship-shaped toy that responds precisely as the real-life giant of tomorrow will do. They tested the model, shaved it to an even better shape, continuously checking by slide rule until they could claim perfection. The graceful shape of the liner to be was worked out on what was virtually a toy ship in a very scientific bath. It's not easy to realize how elegant, how feminine the ship will seem when she's afloat, because it's a rough, tough, strong man's job building her, right from the moment the job numbers daubed on the first plate. 1061. That's the lady's maiden name, believe it or not. She'll be Oriana only when she's wed. The hull planned in prefabricated units, each weighing up to 40 tons. Shipwrights like Abbotson there would call the cranes with his whistle, or once the keel-laying flags were away, with choice curses. And they'd haul the units into place like pieces in a giant's construction kit. These welders have, to a large extent, turned riveting into shipbuilding history. Men who've been building ships for generations work metal like those wax models in the test tanks. Work it, and then drill it as easily as wood. No, there's nothing ladylike here, where brawny men turn blueprints into steel honeycomb, where seasoned craftsmen bend metal into sheer beauty. The ship manager constantly keeping a watch on the work. the prefabricated parts are hauled out to this giant's playpen around the building slip, where a new generation of monster cranes can pick them up like parts in a do-it-yourself kit. It only takes 300-odd sections to create the complete hull of the ship. It's model-making on a truly gigantic scale.
Shankside brackets and protruding frames close in for the welders to join them together. Section by section. And now a 40-foot deck plate swings into position for the automatic fuse arc welders to get busy. Meanwhile, the fineries. All the rich silks, the monograms, and embroideries. Rich fabrics require the right blueprints, too. Now, the turbine. Superheated steam drives them at up to 10,000 revolutions a minute. In all, there are over 26,000 delicate blades of stainless molybdenum steel. One of the two main gear wheels. Weight, just 60 tons. Something curvaceous in this clanging workshop. A raw hint of the loveliness they'll be when the welding is done. Soon, elegant travelers will dine here in the restaurants to be. They'll remember Edek, perhaps, for blood melon served with ginger. While one of the welders remembers the blood blister he got blowing that aluminium superstructure off. One of the twin propeller shafts will be housed here when the bossing has been bored out. To drive Oriana at 27 and a half knots. This is what will give Ariana point. The stabilizer that controls her rolling. Fins 13 feet long, like this, at either side. And now, remember how they settled the shape of this bulbous bow unit months ago, shaving away at that wax model back in the experiment tank? That's light aluminum alloy. By using this instead of heavy steel for the superstructure, the designers were able to add an extra passenger deck. Gulliver performed feats like this by hand at Lilliput. That's one of the two tourist class swimming pools in one great welded unit they're swinging aboard. Quite suddenly, so much is happening. Port propeller, 19 feet diameter, 28 tons of manganese bronze, with a thrust of 160 tons that'll churn the blue sea behind her into a river of foam. A sea where aluminium takes over. Above B deck, no more steel is used. Oriana has secondary propeller assemblies as well as her two main ones, so that she can do delicate maneuvers in narrow waters and glide gracefully into any boat. For these, she has steel casings across her line at bow and stern, the equivalent of a built-in tug at either end. That makes her captain the first man who can stand on a liner's bridge and say, full speed, sideways. A load of plumber's pipes goes aboard, the scuppers. Things are getting more nautical now every minute. Winches, bollards, bulkheads, capstans, guffs, and larboard jibu bars. This is the vocabulary of the sea that the promised bride is acquiring so fast. But what miracle speed is this? 
Everything all ready, so ship shape. One of the decorative architects walks through cabins and alleyways for which he's been responsible. And he walks bang into the joiner's shop. For these are sample cabins built ashore as the shape of things afloat that are still to come. Oriana's wedding preparations take many scrupulous forms. As if those seagull bridesmaids realize the fact, wedding day has really dawned. Christening day it's called, but with ships, wedding and christening are one. The crowds have gathered for the great ceremony. Craftsmen who have brought a dream into exciting life and fashioned the whole spick and span trousseau of this new bride of the sea. Princess Alexandra of Kent has come to ask God to bless Oriana and all who sail in her. A right royal launching. I name this ship Oriana. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Bride moves slowly, unfalteringly down the aisle. With half the population of Barrow in Furness to give her away and wish her well. taken two full years from the so-called keel-laying, the betrothal, to this day, when the sea can embrace the lady and call her his own. And there's still a lot to do on what you might call her going-away clothes. It's a meticulous craft, designing dresses and decor for this particular lady, picking the shades and the perfect texture for her curtains, her carpets, her chairs. She must be dressed so that she goes on looking lovely for many and many a busy year. Easter bonnet for the bride. And furnishings for her boudoirs. Underfoot elegance there must be. And first the teak timbers are counterboard to hold them fast to the deck face. Now corking. The one thing that's scarcely changed since man first began building the smallest boats.
television aerial. That married life business of keeping up with the Joneses. But we're off. That honeymoon, it's started. And all the attendants of her ladyship are making time charts, taking fixes, busying themselves with schedules. Because this is the crucial test of tests. Ariana's trials. We know she'll sail through triumphant, but now we can only hold our breath. Two captains. One is in charge just for the trials, a pilot representing the builders. In command until all is approved and sealed and signed. And tantalizing it is for him, the best man, so to speak, so temporarily responsible for all 40,000 tons of her. From the compact console in the control room, the most modern one built, down to every individual sailor in the crew, 900 strong. There, Captain Clifford Edgecombe. He's the man who will soon give all the orders and have full responsibility. The first automatic baggage system ever installed in a ship. Those suitcases have a lift journey to storage through seven decks. The Starn Gallery Bar, a peaceful sun trap. The first class gallery. Those shipping directors have good reason to be proud of the biggest liner ever launched from an English yard. Every detail of design has been planned by teams of architects and coordinated by a design team for perfect harmony. Even the ashtrays have been specially designed for Oriana. Here's Oriana's own television station. Closed circuit television all through the voyage, network programs when the ship's in port. Her receivers are adaptable to all the different live programs of all the ports and countries along her route. You can take your choice for an evening's entertainment. The liners Lush Plus Cinema, or television in cozy viewing lounges, and in some of the cabins too. Now Oriana's getting speed up for the measured mile, the climax of her trials off the rugged island of Aran. This electronic revolution counter was installed specially for the trials. In severe weather conditions, she did a mean speed of over 30 knots on this mile. She's lived up to her builder's ambitious expectations and her owner's hopes and requirements. Now she can cruise to Sydney, Auckland, Honolulu, California, Vancouver. Arabs will blink at her beauty as she inches through Suez. Calypsos will welcome her to Trinidad. Latin American horsemen will spot her from the hot hills beyond Cristobal. There's just one more formality. 
the official handing over. The builder's representative prepares a receipt, one ship in good order, for a director of the shipping company to sign. she's a ship of the line and everyone in Britain shares the thrill for ships are in our blood we learn to love them when we're still learning our nursery rhymes ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady upon a white horse and this is the sort of fine lady we're so often thinking of on these sort of white horses ride the Moriana show your beauty around the world